Hi folks, Canadian Prepper here, late night emergency video for you today on the World War III front. This is going to be a bit of a hot take, but this is something we were warning about last year, when the Russians were retreating from Kyrgyzstan. We talked about how they may blow the Kakovka Dam, they as in either side, because both sides are accusing the other of this particular incident that you're seeing right here. This Kakovka Dam goes across the Dnieper River. It serves a variety of functions. It's a hydroelectric plant. It's also a road. And it also dams up the water so that the Crimean Canal can be fed. That's where the Russians in Crimea get all of their water and irrigation needs met. This is a massive blow to Russia. They are not going to let this one slide. The war just escalated in a way that nobody really anticipated, or we did anticipate, but we just forgot about it. We thought that they were going to honor Article 56 of the Geneva Convention and not do something like this. Because there are rules to war, but none of those rules are being honored on either side of this conflict. I mean, the idea of having rules of war means that you need somebody to enforce those you know, rules. And when you're talking about World War III, it's unenforceable. So what we have here is there's four possible explanations. One, the Ukrainians did it. One, the Russians did it. One, the Ukrainians shelled it at an earlier date or the Russians shelled it at an earlier date and the failure only occurred now due to the accumulation of spring runoff in the river. The Dnieper River is highest right around this time of year because March and May from that period of time, that's when everything melts. This is peak river time right now. And the river is actually at a higher level than usual. So this, some people are suspecting that the damage was caused last year during the Kyrgyzstan retreat. And we do have some footage of that actual event. This is what happened last year. Okay, so this is the dam and it was shelled. The Russians claim that it was hit by HIMARS. Now the Russians also claim that they intercepted several att attempts to use HIMARS on this bridge last year. But the Ukrainians are insisting it was the Russians uh, who did it. Now, qui bono, who benefits from such an event? We're going to talk all about that right now. There are, as far as I can tell, several reasons why Ukraine stands to benefit. And maybe one reason how the Russians benefit. Maybe two. Now, if you go on Ukraine's uh, main page right now, they're saying, as expected, Russians blow up the Kakovka hydropower plant. This is Ukrainska Pravda the mouthpiece for the uh, Ukrainian Defense Ministry, essentially. If you go to Rio Novosti or Russia Today, I'm just going to go out on a limb here, and I'm going to think that they're probably blaming the Ukrainians. Oh, look at that, they are. The mayor of Nova Kakovka, the upper part of the Kakovka hydroelectropant was destroyed during shelling. So he's claiming that this was destroyed due to Ukrainian shelling. Now... Who stands to benefit because, as expected, both sides are going to blame the other. And there's another big elephant in the room here, and that is the nuclear power plant up the way, which is on the same river, if I could find it here, I've zoomed out too much, there it is, Anaradar, this is where the nuclear power plant is. If these water levels drop as a result of that dam being blown or collapsing due to being previously hit with uh, shells, then the ability to efficiently cool nuclear reactors and spent fuel rods and nuclear fuel is going to be compromised in energy dar. Of course, it's already a situation that is uh, very sensitive due to the fact that there's fighting in this region going on. So I'm sure that the IAEA is going to have a lot to say about this, as is the UN. Now, four reasons why the Ukraine stands to benefit. One, you cut off the water supply to Crimea. Okay, this is the North Crimean Canal. This is where it goes, and it goes all the way up. Now that is no longer going to have the water built up in order to reroute that water to here. It's just not going to happen. All of Crimea relied on that water for irrigation. Now the Russians are going to have to truck in water because you know that dam ain't getting fixed 
in a war zone. It's going to be a long time before that dam gets fixed, okay? That means that either Crimea is going to turn into an abandoned wasteland because now what sort of incentive are people going to have to stay there? Is Crimea just going to turn into Bakhmut is the question. Guys, this war just got deadly serious. Now, the other potential reasons, that's one of the ways that Ukraine stands to benefit. The other reason why Ukraine stands to benefit is because the bulk of the detrimental effects of the flooding are going to be felt on the left bank. Okay, water flows this way. The left bank is going to be the most compromised. That's where not only Russian townships exist and Russian villages and whatnot, or Ukrainian villages now under the control or annexation of the Russians, I should say more precisely, and possible Russian fortifications and military equipment. Now, I think the Russians were smart enough not to put themselves too close to this fault line because they knew at one point that this is something that the Ukrainians might do and that it could effectively happen at any time, as did the Ukrainians. But the Ukrainians, this side, this bank of the river, I think it's at a higher elevation or just the way the floodplain is uh, carved into the earth here. It, it's going to affect more to the south than it is to the north. So people in Kyrgyzstan have less to worry about. Probably going to be some flooding, but not going to be nearly as bad as what the Russians have to do with. And as you can see, there's probably a lot of agricultural activity that happens in here as well. So that's one other way that uh, Ukraine stands to benefit. The other way is this potential em nuclear emergency. This is going to require more attention. It's going to require more Russian resources and ingenuity in order to maintain this situation if these water levels drop substantially. Now, I don't know when this nuclear plant was built. Was this built before the dam? I'm presuming that they would have had to been built around the same time because obviously... You know, the water levels, uh, the dam is going to be used to regulate somewhat the water level as it's going to affect Europe's largest nuclear power plant. So that's another reason how the Ukraine stand to benefit. The other reason is it's a great excuse for why we need to either postpone the counteroffensive or, or how you can effectively minimize any sort of possibility of a Russian flank because the Russians had the ability to come across the river. In fact, they have a greater capability of doing that because the Ukrainians have no navy anymore. Maybe they have some pontoon bridges that they got from some NATO countries, but now that's going to be virtually impossible. This river is just going to be too big to cross. I mean, we're talking about possible, uh, you know, like 10, 20 kilometers, possibly. This is the worst case projection here. And this really is the worst time that this could happen because this is when water levels are highest. So it could look as bad as, you know, the worst case scenario that they show here. This is how it is in normal times, okay? And this is how it could be with that dam bursting just based on the topography. That's this region right here, okay? So a lot of this stuff is probably going to be underwater at least until that river runs its course and it reaches uh, equilibrium in the water table. But that could be, you know, several weeks. And of course, the damage is already going to be done. What this does, it creates a window of opportunity to potentially redirect all your forces around this side of the river. Because now the Ukrainians, because now Crimea doesn't have that water. So now Russia has a logistics problem. Russia has a problem of evacuating people over here. This might be a great time, and I would not be surprised if we've seen a major counteroffensive in this direction, and possibly just all throughout the front, okay? So that's four ways. The only way that Russia stands to benefit is that now they have basically shortened the front, okay? So this is the front, this is the entire front line, and now we have to include, so it goes all the way from here, all around and it basically the front is going all the way up to Belarus essentially now there's fighting the Ukrainian and their uh, reactionary some of the reactionary brethren that the New York Times are are comically talking about today they're saying 
you know, you shouldn't wear swastikas. The, the Russians might confuse you for NAZIs. We know you're just doing that for fun as a meme, but you know, they might actually think you're NAZIs. That's according to the New York Times, the people who brought you the triple jab. Okay, I'm almost, I'm on the brink here, guys. I'm trying to, trying to keep her on the road because you know, we don't want to get deplatformed before the real party starts here because it looks like it's starting right now. And by party, I mean the most horrific war that we could ever imagine. Now, um, my one of my concerns, we're hearing Mark Milley, we're hearing David Petraeus, we're hearing, what's his face, Lindsey Graham, all talk about this ingenious counteroffensive that the Ukrainians have cooked up. Now, if it has been determined, which we'll never know, because, you know, you got Nord Stream, you got so many crimes that just get committed in broad daylight nowadays that nobody's ever going to be held accountable for anything, even if it's clear as day who did what. Is it possible that they knew that this was part of the plan, that this was the, the genius plan concocted by the Ukrainian Defense Ministry? Is it possible that that was the case? And they were just waiting for this time when the water level was highest. Now, again, they're, according to reports on both sides, both sides claim that they didn't hear explosions. But then again, you have other reports, anecdotal, of course, from witnesses who claim they did hear explosions. And both sides, regardless of what you want to think, both sides are blaming the other side for doing it. So is it possible? And imagine what a gross violation of Article 56 of the Geneva Convention. Imagine, imagine if they knew that this was part of the plan. Okay? And I'm talking about the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Mark Milley, who claims to have been told the plan by the Ukrainians, even though the Ukrainians claim they don't tell anybody the plan, but their inner circle. Um, their inner circle, who's been surprisingly silent lately. We talked a little bit about... Uh, that and the strike on the Ukrainian intelligence agency, is that what it's called? The Ukrainian uh, intelligence headquarters by the Russians, big, you know, black hole in the side of the building. And uh, this Budinov guy, their, in their chief intelligence, uh, the guy who oversees their intelligence program. Anyways, he's been uh, surprisingly silent as of late, much like the commander of their armed forces, Zeluzhny, who some people think may no longer be on this astral plane, but that's just speculation at this point. Anyways, Article 56. Works or installations containing dangerous forces, namely dams, dikes, and nuclear electrical generating stations, shall not be made the object of attack, even where these objects are military objectives. If such an attack may cause the release of dangerous forces and consequent severe losses among the civilian population, now, you could probably stretch this to pertain to almost anything that relates to critical infrastructure, but dams, dikes, nuclear, electrical stations, that's what they say specifically, and all of those things are impacted by this. So could you imagine the controversy that would arise if we actually knew that this was part of the plan? Okay, you with me? If it's this bad, that they're willing to do something like this. And I'm not saying that that's the case. This could be the Russians. Maybe they wanted to destroy their own water supply and flood out their own people and put themselves at risk. Or, or, you know, just they wanted to fight this war with a handicap because it was just too easy. It's going too well. But let's just say it wasn't. Let's just say maybe it was NATO and friends. The same people who, or, you know, the same people, the mysterious people on either side who did Nord Stream, okay? and the Crimean Bridge. If it was them, could you imagine the outrage that will be if the truth ever comes out about it? How our government actually partook in something of this nature. Now again, this could just be a cascading failure of the dam as a result of previous shelling. So we don't want to, you know, speculate too much on this being the master plan, but I'm just saying it looks, it looks bad. It looks really, really bad. Now, another thing I've been thinking about lately, this counteroffensive. And when you really think about this war, guys, and uh, before I dive into this, this speculation, I want you to just take note of this. This is a, um, 
This is from the Ukrainian Defense Ministry. Sorry, guys, it's late. My brain's not working. This is their, their account of what happened. Uh, they claim that um, this was the Russian government. I'm not sure if I showed you these images, but this is from May 31st. This is the condition of the bridge, the bridge, the hydroelectric dam on May 31st. You can see this road is still roughly intact, but it looks quite damaged. Okay, possibly the result of shelling, most definitely the result of shelling. The dam was also damaged over here earlier in the year. Okay, that was from this one blast that we showed you here. We're pretty sure that that's what caused that one because that's where it, it was on the, uh, on the bridge. Now, this is today. So some people are interpreting that maybe what happened was... You know, this was just a cumulative fracture of the of the the dam, and then it just you know was a failure that was the result of pri previous shelling, and this is what it is. It's very possible that that's the case, but I don't know. The, this game is being played so dirty right now, and I gotta ask myself sometimes: Is this counteroffensive? Is this just a buzzword for the start of the real war? Because you have right now NATO mercs using NATO intel, using NATO weapons with many soldiers who are from NATO countries invading Russia. Okay, now think about this. What if the counteroffensive is actually code for start of the war against Russia, between NATO and Russia? All the playing pieces have been moved in position. Now you have the Russians effectively cut off from Odessa. The only way they're going to be able to reach Odessa now is if they were to do it with their naval forces, which are limited in the Black Sea. And then they have to deal with the Tridents and all the rest. So the Ukraine benefits by not having to worry about being flanked by the Russians in that direction. It's going to be very, very difficult now because the Russians are going to have to either you know, find a way to take back that territory. They're going to have to gain total air superiority, which they're not going to have because they're going to be sending F-16s and F-18s. So this pushes the war in this direction towards, towards Russia. Okay, it moves it away from Moldova, away from Transnistria. And that's another thing is now it makes it much less likely that Russia can come to the aid of Transnistria and their 1,500 soldiers, which are now effectively landlocked there, even though they were before, but I'm presuming that this is going to complicate logistics if they ever wanted to, you know, reinforce that area with troops. So it seems that this is a very sinister plan. And uh, I don't know who's at fault. I'm just going to leave it at that. I think you guys probably know where I'm leaning towards in terms of who's at fault for this. And at the end of the day, I mean, you could make the argument that were it not for these rules of war, we just arbitrarily make rules for war, as crazy as that sounds, you could make the argument that they have every right to do that on their own territory, uh, regardless of the consequences. And uh, I'm sure people are going to try to make that argument. I think that no matter how you look at it, it's a massive escalation. The Russians are already viewing it as a terror attack. And how many more red lines are they going to let us cross? We've crossed every single red line. Now Crimea is going to turn into a desert. Okay? Their prize Crimea, without water, is going to effectively become uninhabitable. Unless you truck in water or you pipe in water from the Russian mainland or from that land bridge or you rebuild a dam, which is likely not going to take place. Now, the one possible positive outcome that can happen here, which I highly doubt because both sides are blaming the other, this could cause a ceasefire because this could bring the IAEA into the conversation. This could potentially force people to the negotiating table because now it's going to be impossible for the Ukrainians to stage any sort of offensive in Kyrgyzstan. So that's out of the question, at least for the foreseeable future. This is why the next couple months are going to be so critical in the war. 
because when this water eventually recedes, as it will come, I don't know, like fall or whatever, that's when things are going to kind of start to look how they did before today. And so that means that whatever big things are going to happen are going to happen in the next few months. Um, I just hope that this counteroffensive isn't code for actual start of we're going to go to war with the Russians because all the pieces are being moved into position, whether it's in the northern Ukrainian border, uh, Belarus, Poland, concentrating all their forces in an easterly direction, the stuff going on with Kaliningrad, all the recon planes in the sky, the incursions into Russian territory. It doesn't look good, my friends. Keep on prepping. And if you didn't know, we got more fires to contend with here. This is the fire situation. So the fires have almost been neutralized in the West. And that was the result of some freakish rain that we had, although they are still burning. But now look at this. Canada is burning, man, everywhere in Quebec and Northern Ontario. It is on fire. And that is going to create some nasty conditions in Boston and New York for weeks to come. It's going to be a long, hot, smoky-ass summer. Right when Halifax had their fires put out, now fires just keep erupting everywhere else. We're just in the age of consequences, which is why you guys got to keep on prepping. I hope you found this to be somewhat informative. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe. Keep on prepping. Give the video a thumbs up. And if you want to support the channel, CanadianPreparedness.com. Take care, guys.